Welcome to a new edition of the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with esteemed author and veteran actor Robert Kerbeck. His true crime memoir is about his career as the world's number one corporate spy called Ruse, lying the American dream from Hollywood to Wall Street. It is currently in development for a TV series. His previous book, Malibu Burning, was quite intense and personal as well. He has enjoyed an adventure in acting and writing over a long career full of wonderful stories. Enjoy this interview. It's, it's great to meet you. Thanks for taking a minute out and talking with me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, of course. I'm happy to do it. I'm excited. First and foremost, I want to know, before we get into your life as a writer, you know, we went through quite a time on the planet with the pandemic, and I'm curious how you survived that time period as a creative person, and how subsequently it's changed the way that not only you live your life, but the way that, you know, you approach your business now. Uh, well, that's a great question, because, you know, obviously COVID uh, was, um, you know, just a terrible time. Uh, I had a dear friend who died at 62 from COVID. Um, you know, obviously it really impacted me, uh, you know, in a really uh, tragic way. Uh, I also had a teenager in the house during COVID, uh, which, as you can imagine, uh, was pretty horrific because teenagers are not meant to be locked down with their parents. Um, they're supposed to be out, uh, you know, having fun. Um, uh, it was my daughter's senior year in, college, in high school, so... Um, you know, it was just bad. Um, what I did is, you know, I was writing my book, Ruse, um, uh, finishing it um, and doing the final edits uh, during COVID. And then I started a new book. Um, and, you know, in some way, you know, being locked down, I guess, forced me to be, you know, there wasn't much else you could do, right? So I, I, it forced me to be pretty motivated and it gave me an opportunity to, you know, not get quite so distracted with different things outside the home. Um, or my little surf shack where I write. Um, so, you know, I, I did, uh, you know, I tried to make the best of it, but clearly it was a really, really terrible time. Yeah, I had two teenagers in the house, um, my son and stepdaughter. Um, my son's special needs, so when this happened, his two favorite things in the world are Major League Baseball and school. So when that happened, it's like, you know, you, you have to scramble and yeah. figure it out like we all did, you know. You know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, what you, what you write about with, you know, just corporations that spy on us. And I was thinking, I was listening to a podcast earlier on today about this love of the office. And I got to be, I got a confession to make. I worked in corporate America for probably seven years from like a low to moderate to high corporate. I can't watch that show. I never have. I don't think corporate America is funny. I don't think the office culture is funny. I don't want to see it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm just I'm putting it out there, dude. I am I'm out. I am good. Everybody can have Dwight. They can all have the fun they want. I do not think it's cute. I'm out. There's a lot of funny yeah. in the world. I love comedians. I love funny. But offices and corporate culture is not to me. <laughs> so just so you know that going into this. <laughs> Yeah, well, look, you, you know, you, you, you know, then you're the perfect person to read Ruse uh, because, you know, obviously, you know, uh, the Russians uh, spy on the Chinese, the Chinese spy on us. But what most people are shocked to find out is how endemic and prolific corporate spying in America is. And forget about America in the world. Um, uh, you know, really, there are no corporations that do not hire spies. Now, they will tell you they don't hire spies. Um, and a lot of times they hire an intermediary to hire the spy because they don't want it to be able to be tracked back to them. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that I have personally presented stolen information to individuals that today are one step from being the CEOs of some of the largest publicly traded companies in the world. Yeah, I have no doubt at all. So let's get to what you do exactly with your life. And I'm going to put you in front of a bunch of third graders at a career yeah. day. And one of the kids looks up and says, what do you do for a living? How would you answer them? Well, I, what I, I, you know, I'm not going to talk about what I do now, which is writing. I'm going to talk about the past because, you know, obviously I'm not corp, uh, spying anymore. I wouldn't be a very good corporate spy if I wrote a book and outed myself as a spy and then continued to spy. Um, but what I would tell the third graders is that basically I lie for a living, I pick up the phone, I make up a story that isn't true, and I get people on the other end of the phone to tell me private information and 
corporation secrets that they should never, ever in a million years tell anyone, let alone someone that they really don't know on the phone. Now, of course, I'm pretending to be someone that I'm not, and so I use basically that type of trickery to get people to release that information. So let's go back in your life. Tell me how you got into that line of work where it culminated with you doing that. How did all of this begin for you? You know, even in childhood, what did you want to be when you were a kid? I, you, know, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, look, in a perfect world, I would have been a professional athlete or a rock star, right? You know, but, you know those are kind of common dreams for, for you know, kids because, you know, we, we see the fame and fortune and we're drawn to that. Um, but I grew up in Philadelphia. You know, my, my last name is Kerbeck. The Kerbeck name is very well known in the Philadelphia area because there are automobile dealers. My cousins still have the Kerbeck, uh, many Kerbeck car dealerships today. If you're looking for a deal on a Maserati, tell them I sent you. Um, and when I graduated college, um, uh, you know, this business, my great-grandfather had started it. He sold horse carriages before cars were invented. My grandfather took over that dealership. My father took over that dealership, and I was supposed to take over that dealership. But um, in college, I'd kind of fallen in love with acting, uh, but I didn't have the kind of the, the courage to move to New York to try to pursue that dream. I didn't know anybody that had been, forget about an actor, an artist of any sort. Um, and, um, you know, so I went to work for my dad. And, you know, I worked at the car business for about a year or so, and it, it just didn't feel right for me. I just, it just wasn't kind of the dishonesty and trickery of car sales. Um, just wasn't landing well with me, and so I moved, finally got the courage. I moved to New York to be an actor. Of course, actors need survival jobs to pay the bills while they're trying to, you know, get work. And who stumbles into a job as a corporate spy? But that's what I did. Yeah, my dad was a car salesman, and, and I used to marvel at how good he was, but he used to always tell his friends he wanted me to, you know, not grow up and be a dummy and sell cars. He wanted me to uh, go to college and do something a little bit different. So I used to always kind of hurt my feelings that he would say that, but I think he was just wanting me to kind of get out of something that was sales and, and to do something different. But um I always marveled at what he could do as a salesman, so I understand that world a little bit. Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, having sales skill, you know, having the proverbial gift of gab um, is, is you know, invaluable, you know, uh, because whether or not you're using it to take advantage of people, um, just having the ability to charm people and to win people over, because, you know, we need to do that on a daily basis, you know, and that doesn't mean you're, you're doing something wrong or you're taking advantage of someone, charming someone, uh, being, you know, being maybe a little extra nice to someone so that you can get moved to the front of the line or you can get the reservation at the restaurant that you want for your wife's birthday or whatever it is, right? Um, I think having sa some, some sales skills is really, really a, a, a great life. You know, it's, it's a big advantage in life. So how did this, this journey into corporate America begin for you and how did it culminate? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I start this job uh, as a corporate spy, and, and when I started out, uh, you know, it was just a survival job, to, you know, to be an actor, and I was a working actor. You know, I was doing, uh, you know, theater in New York. Uh, I was getting rave reviews in the New Yorker and the New York Times. I was starring opposite James Gandolfini from The Sopranos and Callista Flockhart, who's married to Harrison Ford. I uh, became a member of the Actors Studio, was being invited up to Paul Newman's place, drinking beers with him you know, peeing next to Al Pacino, getting hit on by Kevin Spacey. I had it made. Um, <laughs> but while I was doing all of that, I, I, you know, I still needed a survival job. Theater doesn't pay very much money, you know, sometimes no money at all. And so I was doing this job for $8 an hour. And, you know, we kind of justified it in the beginning. And, again, this is a rationalization. And in, and in the book, Ruse, I definitely deal with the, the moral issues and the ethical issues and the legal issues of the job. Um, but um, as a young person, you know, I justified it by saying, well, look, a lot of times we're getting information on who the top people are at a competitor firm, who the rock stars are, and then those individuals are getting poached away, stolen away, and they get better jobs. They're getting paid more money. So, you know what, that, you know, you're, I'm doing something that isn't all bad. There's some good to it. You know, it's, it's part of capitalism, you know, uh, and that's how I justified it. Um, and um, and so I was working all the time as an actor, and then I eventually moved to Hollywood and had more crazy acting stories. And, and my book goes back and forth between the spying and the corporate espionage stories, and then 
some crazy Hollywood tell-alls. At one point, I worked with O.J. Simpson the week before he became the world's most famous murderer. Um, we did this exercise video. Uh, the exercise video was introduced into evidence in his trial. Um, you know, people were, wanted to pay me money to talk about the things I'd witnessed on the set, and I witnessed some crazy things on the set. Um, and that TV, that um, exercise video was later recreated in the TV series a few years back, uh, where Cuba Gooding played OJ, and they literally recreated the exercise video, which meant an actor got hired to play me, um, which was pretty crazy. Um, so, uh, you know, so I'm doing this fine, but then all of a sudden my acting career kind of waned, as acting careers can, and that was the moment where I really did a deep dive into the kind of the dark underbelly of corporate espionage and went from making $8 an hour, and in just a few years I was making $2 million a year doing this job. Do you ever look back and think you wish you would have continued to, to act, or are you happy with how things have turned out with, with writing and everything that you're doing right now? Oh, I'm so happy with how things have turned out because, you know, I was an English major in college. Um, I kind of got bit uh, by the acting bug in my junior year, um, mainly because I didn't have a girlfriend and I, I wasn't meeting girls because I was paying for school myself. And um, I was like, man, I, I, you know, I, I need to meet a, get a girlfriend. You know, I'm lonely. And uh, I'm like, well, where are there women? <laughs> and I said, the theater. <laughs> and I was right. Um, but, um, no, you know, I, it's really amazing that I've, I've basically, after all of these years, I've circled back to the very beginning with what I, you know, you know where I started. Um, so it's worked out very well. Acting, I mean, look, writing is hard, and, and really, quite frankly, writing is harder than acting. But writing is hard, and quite frankly, writing is harder than acting. But the thing with acting is, you know, I can write in my shack uh, by myself. You know, I can submit whatever I've written to my agents who can then submit it to publishers. And, you know, and, and you can kind of do all that, you know, by yourself, sort of. You know, now, you do need people to read your work. Uh, and so for the people out there that are thinking about writing their memoir, which I highly encourage, um, you do need people to read your work. And you need people that are critical to read your work, not your, your best friend or your wife or your kid. You know, you need somebody that's going to tell you the truth about what's working and what's not working. Um, but acting, you have to go out into the world, right? You have to interact with a lot of people. And so, you know, that gets, you know, it gets harder, I think, as you get older, too, you know, um, putting yourself out there, driving all around Los Angeles. Um, and, of course, if you want to be an actor, you need to be working all the time. And sometimes working means, you know, you're doing a play someplace, you're doing a short film somewhere, you're doing a student film, you're doing all of these things to keep busy, to keep working on your craft, your instrument, um, so it's a, it's a bit more of a grind um, in a lot of ways, and I think that's something that, that there's a you know uh, people glamorize acting, right? Um, and certainly at a certain level, it is pretty glamorous. But that's such a you know that's like point zero 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 one percent of actors that get to that level. You know, I was a working actor. I have a pension from the Screen Actors Guild, which I'm very proud of. Um, you know, I like to tell people, you know, when, when they look at my acting career and they see that I did Star Trek and Melrose Place and NYPD Blue and ER and all these cool shows from the 90s and early 2000s, you know, I, I describe myself as you think of Major League Baseball, you know, I'm like, I was like the 24th guy on the team of 25, you know, like I made the majors, but you're probably not going to know who I am, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, but but what a great journey! I'm so glad um, you know that you know everything worked out the, the way it did. So, who have you historically looked up to in your life as a hero or a role model? You know, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Al Pacino. Um, not only because he's a crazy good actor, but um, he's a crazy crazy good guy, and and also for that matter, Paul Newman. Uh, as a young guy, you know, I really admired his acting, but, you know, he was another actor that really gave back to actors, as Al Pacino has as well. Um, you know, they've given a lot of money. I mean, you know, Paul Newman and his wife started that, uh, you know, Newman's Own, with the sal which started with the salad dressing and then, you know, branched out into all these other products. And, and uh, you know, my understanding is that all, all of those funds go to charity, which is pretty incredible when you think about that um so you know those are guys that i really really admired as a young actor and still do so you know everyone out there you know we all have these things you know when we look at our lives that 
you know, maybe could have been different or, or if we could give our young selves a piece of advice. If you have a dream tonight and you run into your younger version of yourself, say in your 20s, and you could give that version a piece of advice based on the wisdom and the roads that you've been down, what would you tell that young version? <laughs> well, I don't think he would listen to me. That's the first thing, right? Because <laughs> young, young people, you know, they, they don't listen to the older people very often, I don't think, unless it's a stranger, no. right? Um, right. Uh, but I think that what I will tell the young people out there that might actually listen to me, the ones that are strangers to me, is um, take the journey you want to take. Um, because, you know, you're going to have pressure from your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your spouse, you know, uh, your partner, uh, your boss, um, you know, uh, your friends. Um, but, you know, it's your life. And so you've got to take the journey you want to take. Um, now, you've got to be prepared if you take the journey that you want to take. If things don't go maybe the way you hoped or the way you, you thought, you've got to understand that going in because that's on you. But I think you've got to take the journey you want to take um, because life is short. And as we've seen with the covid we, we, we started this conversation out talking about that. Um, and so that, that would be my advice for a young person. So of all of these very interesting avenues full of story and lore in your life, when you kick back in the easy chair at the end of the day and you think about your life up to this point, what are you the proudest of? You know, I think I'm the proudest of that, you know, I've circled back late in life and now I'm publishing books. You know, I, I you know, my, my current book, obviously, is Ruse about my career as a corporate spy, and my previous book was called Malibu Burning, and it was about this terrible wildfire. I live in Malibu. Uh, I fought the fire with my family. We saved our house. Um, I wrote an essay about it for the L.A. Times, and then a publisher read it and asked me to write a book about it. And I wrote this book. It's the only book about that fire, uh, and it was a horrific fire. You know, we lost a couple thousand homes. You know, people died. Uh, animals died. Um, people lost everything they ever owned. And so, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that here I am many years later, and look, starting a, re you know, even though I was an English major in college, you know, starting a publishing career at, you know, over 50 years of age is no, you know, easy feat, you know, uh, getting an agent, extremely difficult, getting a book published, you know, nearly impossible. Um, so I'm really, that's something I'm really excited about, and I've got a couple other books now that are done, and, and um, I'm really enjoying writing and enjoying having people, you know, you know, read my stuff and reach out to me and tell me, uh, you know, tell me in the case of Malibu Burning, uh, how much it meant that I documented these things. And, and you know, and, and in the book, I talk a lot about how we can mitigate the, the, the uh, you know, mitigate wildfires and the damage from wildfires, because as, as you know, uh, wildfires have become a global issue. And we've had more, you know, as, as, as our world gets, uh, hotter and drier, you know, it's just common sense. We're going to have more fires, and that's what we're seeing in the last three, four, five years. We're seeing these horrific fires that are out of control and killing people and, and burning down, you know, in many cases, thousands of homes. So, you know, so that, that's, I felt good that I was doing something to, I, I hope, help homeowners and, and help the planet. And then in the case of Ruse, again, you know, I was finishing Ruse during COVID, and so I wanted to write something that was fun. I wanted to give some people a page-turner, um, you know, a lot of the reviews say Ruse reads like a spy novel, but everything in it is true. Um, and so that, that really made me feel good that people are actually, you know, you know reading it and, and laughing and saying, oh, my God, these stories are crazy. I can't believe these things really happened, but they did. Of all of the things that you've been a part of, you know, as a creative, what's been the best fan letter you've gotten? Something that just you always remember? <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I got one. Uh, so I played it on Star Trek. I did an episode of Star Trek, uh, the show Deep Space Nine, right? And I played a Cardassian on an episode called The Defiant. And if you read, you know, a couple of articles, you know, there's this big uh, online uh, magazine called Gen uh, Den of Geek, Den of Geek. And they rank The Defiant as one of the top Star Trek episodes of all time or maybe <laughs> the top Deep Space Nine episodes of all time. And I'm in that episode, and, you know, I have a, I mean, you know, I, I have a, you know, I, I don't know how to define whether it's a small or large part, but I have a part. I have lines. I have a character, blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, so, yeah, and I'll, but I'm in full, you know, Cardassian makeup, right? And um, I don't know why, but for some reason, Paramount Pictures and the Star Trek people chose my character to create a Cardassian uh, playing card. 
And so I have my own, you know, like, you know, instead of a baseball card, there's a Star Trek card of me as this Cardassian, uh, which I just think is hilarious. And now, even to this day, I get fan mail from people and what they do from all over the world, and they send me, they send me the card in a, <laughs> in a like, sealed, you know, like, uh, you know, envelope. Um, you know, and they say, you know, with careful instructions, you know, dear Mr. Kerbeck, <laughs> we loved your performance. You were incredible. You were so moving as this Cardassian. Your performance, you're the best actor ever. Would you please use the enclosed magic marker, uh, <laughs> the indelible magic marker, would you please sign? And then they literally, like, have a, like, photocopy of the card with an X where they want my signature, uh, you know, please pull the card out of the protective wrapping, sign the card and then note it and immediately please put it back into the protective, you know, wrapping. Please, sir, don't forget, put it back into protective. You know, like, I mean, and so when I get those and I get those, you know, two, three a week, uh, they, they make my day. Uh, and every time I tell that story, I laugh because it's just, it's just it's just an amazing thing that you know people care that much about Star Trek, and I love Star Trek, so I get it. Um, and so I, I, I really the, 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 that's kind of the thing that that makes me happy. Man, that's a great story. You know, as obviously an actor and 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 you've been in a lot of roles. I'm going to ask you this: Everyone out there has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, your readers, that you live your life. You're in control of you. Who do you think you are? Uh, you know, I'm not too bad a guy overall, you know. I mean, obviously, you know, I was a corporate spy, did a hell of a lot of lying and deceiving, uh, which I'm not proud of, though they are some pretty crazy cool stories. Um, and, and I think that's the thing is that, you know, I, I also like to say, you know, I've gotten better as I've gotten older. You know, you hear, you know, like athletes, oh, they're not as good as they used to be. You know, you know, singers, oh, you know, their, their first album, the second album was their best album. They, they haven't done anything good for 20 years. You know, I like to think I'm, I'm, I'm the best version of myself today, you know, and, um, and maybe the bar was low <laughs> starting out. I don't know. But I like to think that I'm a better husband today, better father today, better writer today, better friend today. And, and so that, that makes me, that makes me feel good about whatever mistakes I've made in the past, uh, you know, and that's for every human being on this planet, right? We're all going to make mistakes, and all you can do is go, okay, I'm going to be better today. I'm going to be better today than I was yesterday. So let's get to the good business, Robert. If anybody out there wants your books, wants to know more about your acting life, anything revolving around your world, where should they go? I love to steer people to my website, uh, robertkerbeck.com, you know, K-E-R-B-E-C-K, because not only can you, you purchase Ruse uh, from wherever you like to buy books, you know, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, your local bookshop. Um, you can also buy Malibu Burning, and you can also see the trailer for Ruse because Ruse is in development for a TV series, and so you can watch the trailer and get a sense of what, you know, the Ruse TV series might look like. That's wonderful. And I got a quick question. I would think one of the biggest mysteries of American pop culture, you know, maybe ever has been this OJ thing. And I'm curious, when you step away now after all of these years and look back at the experiences you had firsthand, do you have this moment where you put two and two together or is it still kind of a mystery like it is for all of us? No, there was a moment there uh, where you, 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 you clearly, I mean, in retrospect, it's clear as day. It's clear as day. Um, and I write about this in Ruse because, you know, that's a whole chapter um, about those, those uh, uh, two days where I spent, you know, basically 16 hours a day with, you know, OJ, um, you know, dancing with him. <laughs> and, and the funniest story, I'll just briefly tell you, the funniest thing was, you know, I am a terrible dancer. And um, I get hired for this exercise video because it's supposed to be an exercise video for guys. And so I was told it was going to be push-ups and pull-ups and maybe we play some hoops, and, you know. And then I show up for the, you know, the, the, to, to work, and it's a dance floor. And there's a guy who's introduced to me as the choreographer. And I'm like, what the hell? And, and then all of a sudden he lines us up, and there are these two beautiful women who clearly are dancers. And the choreographer does a little routine, and he goes, okay, everybody do it. And the women do it in two seconds. You know, even O.J. kind of gets through it. 
and I'm just struggling. And the choreographer comes over and looks at me, and, and, and he basically is like, what are you doing here? How were you hired? And <laughs> OJ says, whoa, 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 Rob's making me look good. You got, we got to keep Rob. Rob's, Rob's dancing's making mine look good. And so, in other words, my dancing was so bad, it was making OJ look good. And in Hollywood, the number one rule is your star's got to look good. And so I was not fired because OJ Simpson vouched for me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's cool, man. Yeah. And so, cool. so we, we kind of bonded from that, and that's why I got a lot of pretty deep insight into his psyche uh, during those two days. Yeah, I bet. Wow, that's amazing. Man, Robert, you've had quite a ride, man. This has been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for opening this book up for me. I really appreciate it. Good luck with everything. I'm actually going to pick the books up. I'm very intrigued and interested. So I, I really appreciate this, and I can't wait to show it to the audience. Oh, thank you, Joe. You need anything, let me know. And uh, if you're ever out my way, let me know, and uh, I'll buy you a beer. Thanks for tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, business, spirituality, and music from around the globe. If you want to hear more interviews, visit the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino channel on YouTube. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.